Welcome to LDI's panel discussion on value-based purchasing. We are looking forward to date today's discussion and we have a lot to talk about. So with that, let me introduce today's panelists who are going to join me today in our discussion about value-based purchasing. First, we have um, Zeke Emanuel, who is the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives and Co-Director of the Healthcare Transformation Institute here at the University of Pennsylvania. During the Obama administration, he served as a special advisor for healthcare to the director of the Office of Management and Budget in the White House. We are also joined by Amol Navathe, who is an assistant professor in medical ethics and health policy and is co-director of the Healthcare Transformation Institute at Penn. He currently serves as a commissioner uh, of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. And finally, we're joined by Mai Pham, who is president of the Institute for Exceptional Care. She served as Chief Innovation Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she was a founding official and the architect of Medicare's foundational programs on accountable care organizations and primary care. So with that, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to what we're talking about today. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, over the past decade, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we have seen a large amount of experimentation with value-based payment and with advanced payment models. These models are alternatives to fee-for-service payment, which alter the way that clinicians are paid, placing more emphasis on the value of care that's delivered rather than the volume of care that they deliver. Examples of these alternative payment models include accountable care organizations, uh, bundled payments or episode-based payments, as well as primary care transformation models, such as comprehensive primary care. When we think back on the last decade of alternative payment models, people will sometimes um, remark that they haven't been very successful. And to some extent, it's possible they haven't lived up, lived up to their potential. I don't want to go over all of that evidence in detail, but I'll summarize it by just saying that while there have not been large spending reductions, in some cases there have been some small spending reductions, though in other cases there haven't been spending reductions at all. There have been some cases of gross savings, but fewer cases of net savings, and when they do exist, they're often less than 1%. And then on the quality front, the impacts have tend to be small as well when there are quality improvements. Another challenge for APMs over the past decade has been their lack of impact on improving health disparities, um, as they've really had no focus on health inequities to speak of, and on, there are ongoing concerns that financial incentives may inadvertently worsen disparities. Despite these limitations of the effect of APM so far, um, there are a number of lessons that we can learn potentially about how to improve them, and there are a number of ways in which we can think about why they've been less effective than we had hoped them to be. Some of those are that alternative payment models have been built primarily on a fee-for-service chassis, and fee-for-service provides very strong incentives to maximize volume, and APMs alone may have not have strong enough incentives to overcome those fee-for-service based, volume-based incentives. That's in part because APMs don't often hold providers to clear budgets. They don't often transfer meaningful risk to providers through what we sometimes refer to as two-sided risk sharing. The, the financial incentives are often small, and so it takes a lot to change provider behavior, and APMs may not have been successful at doing that. The design has also been quite complex for participants. There's also been conflicting um, incentives across programs, and there have been many programs that have been implemented over the past decade. And then uh, often the participation in these programs is voluntary rather than mandatory, which causes a whole host of potential limitations of the impact of APM, including that providers choose to be in the APMs when they, it's possible they would have succeeded even in the absence of participation. And so the effects therefore get diluted. So we're here to discuss what's next. What should the federal government be doing over the next decade to have a more meaningful impact in value-based purchasing or value-based payment? Back in November, the four of us uh, sat down with a group of national experts. There were 13 people who joined us for two discussions about what's worked in value-based payment, what hasn't worked, and where we should go next. Out of that process came a set of recommendations and a roadmap for the next decade of payment reform. This process and work was funded by Signify Health, though the recommendations that came out of it are really a, a product of the conversations that we had with, between ourselves and with those experts uh, nationally. And so with that, I want to turn to um, discussing with my co-authors on the report how we can move forward with alternative payment models. And I would say at a high level, despite the shortcomings and the failures of the, in the last decade of payment reform, 
I think it's fair to say the four of us remain relatively bullish about the future of APMs, and that if we can learn lessons from the past decade, we can transition to a bolder vision of APMs going forward. So, Mai, I want to turn to you and start with one of the first recommendations we had, which was to develop a clear vision for the future of uh, value-based payment and implement them as if they were a portfolio of payment models. You know, I, I think that after 10 years of experimentation, we have an opportunity to take a step back and really think about how um, our priorities should shift after 10 years. You know, it, it was right in the beginning for the agency and for all payers, really, to invest a lot in generating momentum um, for provider participation in APMs. Um, when you generate that much momentum, especially through the strategy of offering as many on-ramps as possible, was a metaphor that was often used, um, you, you certainly generate buzz and you certainly generate a sense that uh, value-based care is an inevitability, but it also generates a lot of traffic um, and it, it can muddy the waters, especially when you're trying to conduct evaluations in a very crowded space of programs with lots of possible spillover effects. So for all of those reasons, and because there's really only so much time and resources that any given payer has, um, even Medicare, um, we think it's very important to prioritize and to focus and to think of how the Innovation Center in particular, but all payers approach value-based payment arrangements as part of an investment portfolio. You, know, you, you wouldn't, um, if you were preparing your retirement portfolio, you wouldn't put money in 16 different places and never look at it again, right? You would track to see where your investments paid off, where they didn't pay off so much, and you would adjust that portfolio over time. Um, and we think it's just as important to do here but to do that with a clear sense of what the long-term goals and priorities are. If a priority is, is reducing disparities, then really make that a priority and make it reflected in the degree of investment that you put there. If a priority is, if, if we know, for example, we have more confidence that uh, payment programs that address total cost of care, like ACO models or primary care models versus programs that really look at just a sliver of care, well, then let's have the portfolio investments reflect that. What we're really recommending here, Rachel, is a pruning and a prioritization process. That's a great summary. Thank you. And I think one of the, the recommendations that came straight out of that um, was that we should also expand what we're doing beyond just Medicare, where value-based payment has traditionally, um, over the past decade, uh, been uh, the focus. And so, Zeke, um, one of the recommendations we made was that we should take a whole a government approach to payment reform and bring in other federal payers into the process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Remember, one of the things that's going to get physicians to change their behavior and other providers to change their behavior is having more of their payment uh, in these models. And I think uh, in your opening, Rachel, you made a, a very good point. But, you know, if you only have a part of the payment and it's a small part of the payment that are on these models, um, doctors are going to relatively ignore them and they're not going to change their workflows and their entire approach to how they provide care to patients. So to amp up uh, how much uh, the doctors are seeing for, uh, both in value-based payment, but also in similar models of value-based payment, so they're not being run ragged by different measurements, different formulas. Uh, you know, we have to remember that the uh, federal government spends a lot of money on health care, and it's not all through Medicare. Uh, you know, 60-plus percent of Medicaid is a federal program, uh, and that could be utilized so you could harmonize the same uh, structure of a value-based payment model through Medicare and Medicaid. There's also the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program uh, that goes for millions of federal employees and their family members. There's TRICARE through the Defense uh, Department. Um, so you can begin to think about all of these programs. And then we haven't uh, even emphasized the exchanges uh, where the subsidies give the federal government leverage that they could use to require the uh, payers in those exchanges to adopt the same kind of uh, payment arrangements so that you could see uh, use the public program, but also use the leverage of paying 
uh, to uh, encourage the private programs to adopt the same uh, framework and models of the value-based payment. That increases the amount of money doctors are seeing in these value-based payment arrangements and therefore increases the salience and motivation of them to change their practice to be more uh, focused on equity, quality, and reducing total cost of care. Yeah, great. And I think that we forget sometimes how much the federal government touches healthcare payment and healthcare delivery outside of Medicare. And so leveraging all of those pieces. Well, really if you think that the federal government or that government public programs account for about 46, 45, 46 percent of all payments, um, some of that is state, but the bulk of that is going to be the federal government. That's a lot of money. And, and that gives you a lot of leverage over the provider community, uh, which really can't opt out of federal programs. Yep. Great, thanks. Um, and then another um, recommendation uh, was that we needed to more directly address health equity. So, Amol, I want to turn to you. The recommendation we made was that promoting equity by designing and implementing um, APMs should be prioritized, and we should prioritize reducing disparities and tie health equity outcomes to financial outcomes. So can you just talk us through that recommendation and some of the specifics of it? Sure. So. I think, uh, as my, uh, you know, mentioned in the first decade, we had this flurry of experimentation. And I think in some sense, testing was the destination in that, in that first uh, decade. And while I think that the federal government, you know, CMMI contractors have, have done a, uh, a, or put effort toward monitoring some of the impacts on vulnerable populations, on populations that face either outsized disadvantages on, social, on the social side or on the clinical side, what we haven't really seen to date is an expressed uh, effort toward trying to design models oriented directly towards addressing health equity issues. And I think given uh, sort of a, a couple of different factoids, if you will, so I think we've seen, for example, in some of these programs like accountable care organizations, that you end up getting non, you know, systematic participation differences, basically. So areas that have higher proportions of populations who are lower income, those, those health systems and provider groups are less likely to join ECOs. Uh, we've also seen that actually recently we did a study where we looked at the mandatory bundle payment program. Even because of the types of criteria around spending that the federal government used, we get, again got systematic differences where populations that had greater social risk were less likely to be uh, able to access providers or participating in mandatory bundle payments. And so I think while monitoring is great and clearly critical, I think it doesn't get us fully there. One question that I think we've had to tussle with uh, in our conversations is how does equity actually fit into the overall mandate around innovation, certainly at least if we think about CMI specifically. And I think the place that it does belong is under the, the, the sort of quality statute, if you will. You know, CMI is supposed to pursue models that not only improve spending, but also improve quality at least uh, you know, keeping one of those the same and then improving the other. And so under quality, I think we can definitely prioritize health equity. And states and other organizations have actually come, I would say, ahead, out on the forefront of doing public reporting for specific uh, populations, either based on racial ethnic minorities or, or by income status others, that I think it's time that the Medicare program also starts to incorporate to try to get back up at the front, if, if you will, uh, in terms of you know, trying to more systematically, more proactively address health equity through the types of innovation programs that Medicare is putting forward. The next recommendation that we made um, actually is related to some of what Amol just talked about, um, related to the mandatory versus voluntary participation in APM. So Maya, I'm gonna turn to you. The recommendation that we made was um, that participation in APM should be mandatory, not voluntary, whenever feasible. And so Amol talked us through some of why that's important, but maybe you could provide a little bit more context for the recommendation. Sure, and I may be adding more color here than is in our report, but just to help you understand some of our thinking. You know, um, part, of, part of how we come into this work is realizing that not all providers are the same. It, among providers, you have different archetypes, if you will. You have true believers who will do value-based care no matter what happens, unless they really go off a financial cliff. You have what I would consider empiricists who will try it. They're very willing to be first to try it, but only as long as it works out for them financially. And as soon as it doesn't, then they're out of there. And you have the followers who wait for those leaders to go first, but then are willing to follow them wherever they go, in or out. 
And then you have the group that, that we would consider laggards, right? The, the resistors, <laughs> the people who will say, not until you make me. Um, and so our concern is that to date, payers have not deployed the tools that they really need to, to get the third and fourth groups into the game. Um, you know, it, it is very important to make the payment models as appealing as is fiscally possible to the leader groups, but there are laggards who are not going to change unless there is a real reason for them to change. So that's one major reason for the recommendation. Um, it, we don't want you to, we want you to understand that it's not contradictory with saying that payers should make payment models more attractive because it, it's targeting different archetypes of providers. But another reason for the mandatory models is, look, if we're, if this is a research and development effort and we're after some answers, it's very challenging to get those answers when you only run voluntary models. Um, because there will be this, this tendency towards self-selection into a model if you think you're going to do well, and people who worry that they won't do well will sit back. Um, and then you get a very skewed, uh, set of answers when you try to do evaluations. Um, it's also difficult to set up comparison groups that are, you know, scientifically credible enough um, to really convince people to to believe um, the evaluation results that you get. And then I think the third reason is is just scale. You know, uh, voluntary models are unlikely to ever get to scale as quickly or effectively as mandatory models. Operationally, that's a lot harder to do for a given payer um, because you have to kind of wait and see <laughs> where people will participate and then, you know, wrap your operations around that as opposed to knowing um, we are going to have this swath here and that swath there. Um, so for all those reasons, it's, it's not that uh, the recommendation is to have all models be mandatory or even that the predominance of models be mandatory. But we, we sense that there has been an undue skittishness about deploying mandatory models that payers need to get over. Can I build on that, Rachel? Um, yeah, I was going to go to you next. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, probably with a different question. So one of the things I think we really need to um, understand is that for a physician practice um, or even a hospital system to actually uh, change how they're caring for patients to adapt to a more uh, greater focus on the quality of care and the total cost of care requires investment on their part investment of resources uh investment of uh energy and time of some of their uh, leadership you know to get the information to change their practices to actually implement them to work out the kinks that inevitably arise when you're changing the workflow around patients maybe to hire uh, uh, you know, care managers or behavioral health specialists or whatever is necessary to actually uh, effectuate the uh, change. Um, groups are going to be resistant and reluctant to do that because of just the time. Forget the money, just the time and ne necessary uh, work that's required. Um, if you have a mandatory model, it takes uh, it takes people over that potential energy barrier, as it were, because they're required by Medicare. Medicare is too big a portion of their book. They're not just required by Medicare, but now they're required by Medicare, Medicaid, maybe some of their uh, commercial uh, business as well. And I think, uh, again, to get them on the escalator, as it were, of changing their workflows, uh, making it mandatory is uh, extremely important to a group that is cautious. It also changes the psychology to, you know, this from this is a demonstration or an experiment to um, this is an ine inevitability and I better get on that train. And I think both of those psychological things are really important to address. Can I riff on your riff, Zeke? I, I can, I, to, can I just, oh, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. We're already getting chaotic. Yeah. Oh, no. The, the riff on your riff, Zeke, is that I also think when a, a large payer says that something is mandatory, it, it evens the competitive playing field. Now everyone has to be in the game and, yeah. and people aren't, you know, making arcane calculations about, well, but I would do better if, if I leave them to do this value-based care stuff and I go and invest in a new surgical suite. Um, it, it removes that, 
that uneven playing field. So I want to ask a question about this, and Amol, I'm going to ask it to you since I cut you off, um, which is when we can't make it these models mandatory, one of the things that we talked a lot about was how to entice uh, people to volunteer to participate. And so this is like a, two, a twofer that you're getting here. One is how can we um, get people to participate more, um, make the programs more attractive through design, which is one of our recommendations. And then a related recommendation is about fee-for-service. How can we make fee-for-service less attractive so that people will, will not just want to default to fee-for-service? Great, great question. So uh, one thing I, I wanted to add to the prior conversation, because I think Zeke and I hit, hit on a bunch of great points. I was recently asked, you know, what's the what's the simplest reason that we have to do mandatory in some sense? And I, and I think it came out of the conversations that we had with the national experts where we identified two big challenges or kind of lessons, if you will, right? One is we need more stringent financial incentives to get real savings. That's kind of a program design point. And then the other point that we got, which I think was articulated by many of the same people, was we need more participation, right? And, we, and we're, we're scaring away providers from participating or we have activation energy. So how do we reconcile those two things? We need program designs that are, that are effective in getting savings. And though at the same time, we need broad participation. So I think that's where mandatory really has to be a part of the portfolio of what we pursue. Otherwise, I don't see how we reconcile those two things. So uh, that being said, Rachel, getting to your point. So, you know, how do we get broader participation? You know, one thing I think that has to be a part, and I think Zeke mentioned this as part of getting to, into the psychology of the physician group, we need to have longer term programs. We need programs that commit to doing this for five or seven years. So providers know that they can actually invest in the infrastructure, invest in the FTEs, invest in changing the workflows. If we don't have longer durations, if, they, if there's a threat, if you will, that a certain type of program could go away after a couple of years, it's very hard to get participation if it requires significant investment. And that actually ties back to my point about and the recommendation that we made about we need a portfolio of models because if we're going to invest in population management strategies, then we need to know that this is a pillar of the program of the program designs going forward, and it's not going to go away. We might have tweaks of models, population management overall, but those investments over five and seven years are actually going to, to bear out going forward. And then the other question you, you asked was about, you know, how do we make fee-for-service in some sense less attractive? Because even if you make a, APMs really attractive, you make bonuses and whatever else, at the end of the day, if fee-for-service is the way it is, I think we're, we're stuck. Uh, in some sense, I think MIPS, you know, a lot of us have criticized MIPS, and I think perhaps for good reason, if there's one thing that MIPS may have done inadvertently right, is starting to make fee-for-service a little bit less attractive. So I, I think as we've seen commercial insurers have, that have done this effectively, what they've done is communicated forward. They've been strong in signaling forward that, hey, you know what? Fee-for-service is something that's not going to be prioritized. We're not going to invest more money into fee-for-service. In other words, don't expect payment updates. Don't expect fee schedules to go up. We're going to do things like freeze the fee schedule for the next five years. All of those dollars are going to be shifted into the value-based payment models, and we're going to enrich those models in terms of bonuses, in terms of more generous benchmarks, in terms of ways to make it the right thing to do financially for organizations. That way, we're removing this huge headwind otherwise for participation. Okay. So, um... Thank you all. Um, we're getting a ton of great questions coming in. Let me just start by saying, letting, letting you guys weigh on, on uh, one question which came in a little while ago, which is um, that, uh, is it fair to say that the evaluations of the CMMI payment models are a reflection of the way they were implemented rather than the models themselves? And I think that um, it's worth just reiterating our answer to that. And so, um, uh, Mai, I'll start with you. You were at CMMI. <laughs> yes, I was at CMMI, and, and there were many debates about the nature of evaluation. They became quite existential at some points. Um, I, you know, look, the reality is um, we, we want, we all want this to be nice and tidy as scientific experiments. That is not the nature of the world. It never was, but over the past 10 years, it has definitely grown in the other direction. You now have payment programs from a multitude of public and private payers dotting the land, and even providers who may not themselves be in a payment arrangement um, have peers who are, right, or some other part of their health system may be. 
and so one has it, it's very difficult to um, to avoid the conclusion that there may well be pollution and spillover effects here that are changing providers behavior on the ground in ways that um, confound the evaluation results and in all likelihood they may be dampening the the positive impact of some of these programs and or the losses on some of these programs we it's it's really challenging to know um, and so I, I I think one gauntlet that we would throw down is for future evaluations to consider kind of proxy methods for taking that into account um, and, and being, you know, and, and policy decision makers being more open to a certain level of uncertainty. Um, it is just not realistic to expect that a binary answer of yes, this is statistically significant and a win, or no, this is statistically significant and a loss, it's just not realistic to expect current evaluation science to produce those answers. And I think one of the things we talked a bit about was that we shouldn't expect to win in all areas, right? So primary care may not be an area in which is which is going to produce cost savings, uh, especially over the short term. I, I think that goes back to the portfolio question. And I know that the, the the legislative wonks in the audience will say, oh, well, that's a statutory issue because Congress, you know, uh, only authorized the Innovation Center to test models with the potential to generate savings. That may be true and it may require a legislative fix, but the reality is a health system as a whole does not live by those rules. Um, a health system is interconnected in many ways and we can identify multiple areas in the healthcare system that, that are just by common sense in need of a tremendous amount of positive investment without any expectation of net savings. Um, for To Rachel's point, the primary care sector stands to lose $15 billion just last year in the pandemic. Um, so there, it, it just doesn't compute to then offer primary care a modest care management fee and expect it to generate net savings. That's just not going to happen. So I would, I would also elaborate what I said um, in another way, which is that we have some good evidence in some of the models uh, that the baseline, the control group, also saved money. And so you have to scratch your head and say, well, you know, it's very ha hard to save money when everyone else is saving money and they're not in the experiment. Why are they saving money when we know that the trajectory of spend has been up and up and up? And you've got to believe that there's some spillover effect, that there's some psychological effect uh, that our uh, other groups are implementing, even if they're not part of uh, a particular demonstration project. And I think, again, this, uh, you know, both Amal and uh, my uh, emphasize, this makes evaluation hard. One of the advantages of mandatory is it doesn't make it easy. It just makes it easier uh, to control for some of those um, uh, variables that we can't see or we, we may not know exactly what is happening uh, in a real world uh, uh, test. Um, and so I think that, you know, again, it becomes uh, a bit of a challenge, but we, we it, I think it does uh, reinforce the idea of doing a mandatory uh, uh, experiment whenever we can. I want to bring a question about Medicare Advantage into the conversation, um, which is um, that given that the enrollment in Medicare Advantage is going up, we're about 40% enrollment enrolled in Medicare Advantage at this point, um, and there is also increasing enrollment in Medicaid managed care organizations, um, how do you think of value-based payment at, um, alongside of those? Um, and is it time to actually just move towards a full risk capitated network instead of value-based payment? So, I mean, I think Medicare Advantage uh, in a lot of ways tells us that we're headed in the right direction, right? So if, if you look, you know, at the end of the day, Medicare Advantage has been, I think, very successful if you look at the data in terms of using health plan functions, utilization management, network design, as well as, you know, contracting with, with high quality providers, et cetera, to try to generate savings. And they've successfully done that and used that to then offer supplemental benefits. And that's been good for beneficiaries, right? Now, whether the Medicare Advantage program itself is saving money for the federal government is a separate question. I'm going to punt on that one and set it aside for a second. Okay. So 
That being said, I think if you think of Medicare Advantage as a successful program, then I think moving towards global accountability, if you will, is likely the path forward here. And I think what we need to think about this as is rather than having two separate non-equal systems, which is kind of what we have right now, we have MA, which probably has much more generous benchmarks than a comparable Medicare shared savings program or next gen ACO or what have you on the other side. And at times, work that Zeke and I have done has shown that the same health system that's participating in both programs has a better benchmark in MA and is killing it in MA and then suffering in MSSP. Those, those kind of things just don't make sense, right? We need alignment across the entire Medicare program. So I think MA in some sense, you know, beacon of yes, we are headed in the right direction, but man, do we have a lot of work to do to get alignment across these two programs so we're creating an equitable playing field for providers and health plans, et cetera. And I think we're starting to see now with direct contracting, direct contracting geo, that there's a little bit of a convergence there perhaps. And we are seeing some of those MA lessons being applied on the fee-for-service side. And, and maybe down the road, there'll be some sort of convergence or at least at minimum, we get some alignment. I, so it, not to take anything away from what Amal said, which I largely agree with, but I do wanna point out some nuances. You know, there is alignment in the current day and the go forward, but the reality is that the federal government invested a ginormous amount of money in Medicare Advantage for over 20 years in order to get us to this point. And in comparison, the government has tried to hold ACOs accountable to spending better than they did historically based on a comparison to their own historical baseline year upon year upon year. We are now going into the 10th year of rebasing for some of these ACOs. And so I completely champion the notion of getting to better alignment, but we have to understand that we're, we're trying to get there from a deficit of multiple decades of, of a differential in investment. And so it shouldn't be a mystery why even willing, capable ACOs are not getting the returns that would convince their CFOs to stay in the game. Okay, Zeke, did you want to weigh in? No, I was. I just reemphasize a point Amal made, which is that the the very, very explicit idea behind direct contracting is to make the fee for service system look more like the Medicare Advantage system. And so, I think the premise behind your question, Rachel, is definitely yes. Um, we are trying, or you know, at least the people who designed direct contracting, trying to shift uh, um, the Medicare uh, fee for service to look more like Medicare Advantage and as Amal said, to uh, uh, obtain some of the uh, important savings uh, um, and improvements that Medicare Advantage has been able to bring to bear, uh, like adding dental benefits as a standard part of uh, packages for many uh, MA plans. Um, these are important things and important things to uh, many, many seniors, and uh, we shouldn't forget that. I just I don't, I, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact, though, that the legacy ACOs do not fare as well in direct contracting. In fact, they enter the direct contracting yeah. model with, again, historical benchmarks. So just calling out yeah. that there, there are yeah. there's no, some think, cognitive dissonance there. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think it's important that we recognize that this is, it's a huge deal to start inviting health plans in via these direct contracting models into the fee-for-service program, right? And depending on your vantage point, this could be a great thing because I think a lot of us believe that the reason that MA may be more efficient is because of those health plan functions. At the same time, there's, I think, legitimate concern that this could actually kind of deconstruct the last decade of innovations in the fee-for-service world that have been very provider-centric. And I think my, you're highlighting one of those you know, specific program details that could be really problematic going forward. So I think it's, in some sense, it's great. It's innovative, it's innovative and we're moving forward but we should be mindful of the fact that it could have some pretty big repercussions across the portfolio, if you will. And I, I think that that goes to a point that we emphasize, Rachel, and it's worth bringing out, which is the very important of, uh, importance of design elements in these models. And in particular, as everyone is emphasizing, you know, what that benchmark is, where that benchmark comes from, who you think the comparator group is, is very important. So some of the programs which we think have, you know, not made money or lost money, you know, that may be because of the way the benchmark and the comparator were designed, not because of, you know, that the intervention didn't lead to 
change in practice and savings. And so I think part of what we're emphasizing is uh, a little more attention to those benchmarks. And as uh, uh, Mai has put it, you know, don't expect savings in one year. You know, one of the advantages the government has is these people are going to be with you until the end. And therefore, we should take a long term perspective for returns um, and not a short term. Let's get the savings ASAP. That's more a business for profit business model. And we should not have uh, uh, CMMI uh, uh, beholden to that. One of the things that we also talked about um, was how to incorporate specialists into uh, these alternative payment models, and particularly as we uh, advocate for expanding alternative payment models to cover more and more of the market. Um, it's not clear what role specialists should play and how they should be integrated. So I'm going to uh, ask you, Amol, to first comment a little bit on how we were thinking about specialists. And th this question actually is going to be, it was specifically about behavioral health. And so we can um, address that in a minute. Uh, but let's first talk about um, specialists in general. Sure. So uh, I think, you know, traditionally, in the, if you look back now at the innovation that's happened, ma the majority of the specialty-based reform has happened under the umbrella of episode-based payments or bundle payments. So the oncology care model, the bundle payments for care improvement type models that have engaged specialists. Uh, you know, at the same time, they're not excluded from ACOs. And I think one interesting lesson for us looking back is if you if you do look at surgical specialists, you know, 20, 30 percent, I think we did some work on this, like 20 to 30 percent of, of surgeons are actually participating in an ACO towards the end of the last decade. That's a lot. But if you actually look at the impact on surgical care, it's been actually pretty much next to nil, right? So, so I think either we need to do a couple things. Either we need to figure out how to make ACOs and those types of population management programs much more targeted in the way that they drive care redesign at certain high cost, perhaps specialties, or we need to more proactively embrace episode-based payment models as the way to do specialist reform and, and perhaps double down on what we've done. I think right now we're seeing uh, you know, a shift towards uh, service line-based episode-based payment models, which may make a lot of intuitive sense to a hospital service line leader, right? So cardiovascular service line, orthopedic service line, gastroenterology service line, those are the types of ways that health systems actually innovate. So, you know, my personal two cents here would be, I think we're going to be much more successful if we align the way that programs are trying to engage specialists with the way that specialists and hospitals and, and systems think of themselves and the way that they operate, which is in service lines, uh, rather than trying to figure out how to take a big umbrella program and then find ways to, you know, specifically steer it towards certain specialists, which to me seems uh, particularly daunting. And so some specialties like behavioral health are going to be more challenging to integrate into alternative payment models, in part because the technologies um, to help them communicate uh, electronic health records and like that are lagging in behavioral health. I wonder if any of you want to comment on um, that. Yeah, so, so Rachel, I, I think it's not an or, but rather an and to the approaches that Amal was describing is to, um, to think about the very small number of specialties that really, um, for the most seriously ill patients, serve, do serve as the medical home for those patients. So, for example, into that bucket, I would put dialysis centers for end-stage renal disease patients. Um, I might put oncologists, although we're not going to debate the oncology care model today. Um, and, and I might put behavioral health specialists for people with serious mental illness um, or other, you know, other mental health conditions that are really predominant in their clinical experience. I think in those cases, there is an opportunity to, to offer what would still be a total cost of care program but really geared toward the care coordination, centralized management of care by those specialists for that much more um, targeted subpopulation. We, we generally, I think, uh, don't like taking, carving people out of ACO general populations. That's not the goal. We shouldn't have a carve out for every subspecialty in the land. But there may be some very particular clinical circumstances where you know, that's the natural that's the natural um, state of the care relationship, that those patients who are most seriously ill tend to rely on those subspecialists the most. As long as, the, but those specialists then have to be able to step up. They have to be willing to take on global accountability for those patients, rather than thinking of them only in terms of a single organ system. 
One thing I would add to what Mai said is, I think this actually touches on two of our other recommendations very nicely. You know, one is certainly the equity one, where we see that uh, you know patients, beneficiaries with mental health illness, oftentimes face different outcomes than others. And I think the other is the whole of government, right? So we know that Medicaid also takes care of a lot of these uh, populations, particularly who have very serious mental illnesses. In some cases, Medicaid has already done a lot there. So I think to the extent that we can create alignment and one propel more of that kind of aligned innovation between Medicare and the states, I think there's a lot of opportunity. There are innovative states out there. The state of Washington, for example, has done a whole ton of work in this space that could be scaled across the program to create alignment. So totally agree with what Mai said. I think it does align with our other recommendations as well. Good point. Um, let's talk for a second about COVID, the pandemic. Um, uh, so uh, COVID has revealed many things about healthcare in this country and uh, many fault lines that are in the current system. And I wonder if you um, could comment, maybe I'll start with you, Zeke, um, on how, if at all, COVID has changed your thinking about alternative payment models and fee-for-service um, and how we can implement lessons that we've learned from the pandemic. Um, well, I do think COVID has upended a lot. Uh, if we think back to January 2020, and, you know, for some of us, that seems like yesterday. For many of us, it also seems like a decade ago. But in January 2020, you know, people like me uh, and others were saying, you know, we're definitely going to get a big push on uh, drug price controls. We're definitely going to get big push um, on payment uh, reform uh, and you know, that's upended everything, I think. Um, I don't see uh, drug uh, price controls or regulation coming on board. Um, I don't see a big push on uh, cost control except for one element, uh, and that's Medicare uh, trust fund insolvency, if that becomes a, a hot issue that will uh, attract attention. Um, so I think um, from a legislative standpoint, I don't see a lot of initiatives or movements uh, that are going to do this. And so we are almost entirely reliant on CMMI to, uh, to focus on uh, cost control. Um, the flip side is I do think that there will be a lot of pressure on CMMI to also focus on expand using its powers, which it hasn't hitherto, to expand coverage um, and do that in some novel uh, ways. Um, and so I think the consequence of COVID is, you know, probably bring back the coverage emphasis as a regulatory item uh, and uh, going to make most of the legislative change, uh, changes that we might have imagined or might have been possible uh, to put them way back on the back burner. The other thing it will have done is um, uh, make equity uh, absolutely essential. I don't think any program now uh, will be uh, uh, able to not have uh, be evaluated through an equity lens. That's both in its development and in its evaluation um, and assessment of its real impact. And so I think that uh, is going to be a marked change and uh, improvement uh, in the uh, in the way we undertake uh, new demonstration projects. So. Uh, I don't know if that answers exactly your question, but I, I do think um, our expectations have to be altered because of COVID and the expectation of anything legislative on healthcare, um, other than maybe in expanding the uh, subsidies. Um, just I just put it as a very low probability event over the next four years. Rich, I, I, so I completely agree with Zeke. I would also point to some specific um, fault lines that the pandemic has unveiled for us, which we can turn into opportunities. And so one, I think we need to recognize that there are parts of the delivery system that have been completely decimated by the pandemic. So we've talked about primary care already. I would put rural hospitals and clinics into that category as well, as well as safety net systems. This, these are areas that are going to require massive reinvestment, and, and that is an opportunity for reimagining as well. Um, so that's one point. Another is, this is very wonky, but COVID has exposed the complete inadequacy of our current risk adjustment approaches. Um, 
There is no risk algorithm where if you just add the COVID codes, you can account for the loss in utilization and the variation in drops in utilization over geographies and across providers and across populations. You can't account for that, then the risk adjustment is completely valueless in the context of a pandemic. Um, so it has exposed that shortcoming. And I think it has also exposed, frankly, the, um, the opportunity for payers as well as providers to think much more proactively about where there can be collective action, where there can be a pooling of resources, where there can be collective investment in uh, community resources, and um, efforts to address social drivers. It's not that those conversations hadn't been happening, but they get much more real in the context of a pandemic and that exposes so much disparity, um, not just in clinical outcomes, but in what communities have what resources to play with. And, and now that we have experienced it, we really have no excuse for not building that into value-based payment programs. We can pretend we have excuses, but we, we don't really. So, you know, as, as one example, um, it's, it's a very kind of elemental idea, but you could have a process metric and a quality scorecard that says, do you have the ability to share data with your public health department? It's a small thing, um, but so much hampered our response to the pandemic because there wasn't that proactive engineering for collective action. I agree with Zeke and I just want to add two really quick points. Uh, you know, one is it's been one silver lining, if you will. Obviously, most of the things that have happened over COVID are terrible. Um, but the way that we saw the health system suddenly change on a dime towards remote care and telecare, you know, we, we had had those technologies for a decade, right? And we had been trying to make the case, if you will, to our provider community to adopt them. And suddenly we saw the provider community do it, like literally overnight. So that's pretty amazing. I think that should recalibrate our expectations for what the health system can do in terms of shifting. I mean, it is capable of pretty dramatic shifts. We should keep that in mind. I think the second point of reality, however, is that if you just look at the points that Maya was making about the impact on, on utilization and such, I mean, these have been really dramatic shifts and dramatic uncertainties that clinicians and practices and health systems and leaders have faced over the past year, right? So the idea that we're going to come out of the gates here, uh, you know, towards uh, in this sort of second year of the pandemic and make really strong, financially stringent programs that require a ton of investment and, uh, again, institute uncertainty onto these groups, I think is just unrealistic and probably very unfair. So I think we also need to calibrate our expectations on the timeline of being able to really pick up the momentum of value-based care that we had right sort of entering into the pandemic. Can I, the only, the can only I, go ahead, Mike. No, no. I, I was going to just ask if I could close the loop to an earlier conversation we had about making fee for service less attractive, which is not just about the ability to generate volumes of billings and fee for service, but also the prices paid in fee for service. And when Amal touches on this this mini revolution that we've seen, cultural revolution that we've seen around acceptance of telehealth. Um, it does raise the question of, well, what really is possible in a new kind of care delivery system? And could the prices for that new care delivery system be more sustainable than what we're currently paying for bricks and mortar? Right. I, I think that is a question that um, payers with fortitude could really could really force an answer to. They could they could put out a challenge and say, you know, we will offer you uh, 90 cents on today's dollar if you deliver a cost of, you know, a, a, an operating model for clinical care that costs only 70 cents on the dollar. You'd make a 20% profit, but you would have moved the care delivery system to something that is more sustainable in the long term. It, it would have been fantasy a year ago, maybe less fantastical now because we are seeing startups and new multi-organizational ventures that are trying to build this much more nimble, much more resilient kind of care system, care delivery system than what we currently had historically. Okay, so um, we have about five minutes left. Um, I wanna end with one wrap-up question for each of you. 
and you guys all like to talk, so I think we'll take all five minutes to do this. Um, a great thing. Um, so this is a question. We made these recommendations um, for a roadmap for the next 10 years. And so when we get to 2030, how will you know if we if this has been successful, if APMs um, have been successful? Like, what is it that you're looking for? Is it the solvency of the trust fund? Is it having more people under APMs? Walk us through your thoughts about where we need to be a decade from now with uh, APMs. So Zeke, why don't we start with you? Oh, I was going to finish. Um, so I, no, no, I'm joking. Um, I, uh, I think that there are uh, really two metrics uh, or three metrics that I'm uh, uh, looking for. First of all, I think all providers have to be in uh, predominantly paid by an APM, and not just the government, but through government, private payer. I think we need a harmonization on a model, and that has to be every. Uh, uh, physician uh, group and uh, hospital systems have to be on that uh, and involved in it. Um, and I do think that's absolutely critical um, because it's hard to make any other uh, big changes uh, if uh, people are still focused on making money for doing more things. I think making money for, I won't say doing less, but doing things smarter is going to be really, really important. The second thing I want to, I think is important to look at is one of the great achievements that, you know, I count, but everyone else, uh, people don't, I think, emphasize is, you know, we've kept our total cost of uh, uh, health care uh, at uh, under 18% of GDP. Um, if we can keep total health care spending under 18% of GDP going forward, in other words, we've got a plateau, we're not going above 18%, I think that would be a huge achievement. Uh, huge achievement. Um, and so I look at that very, very carefully. You know, we may not know what's going into that number, but if we can actually do that, it would make a big difference to the economy. Now, whether the, you know, uh, government policymakers can distribute that money in a sensible way to uh, alleviate poverty and to decrease uh, um, inequal income inequality and improve the uh, uh, outlook for uh, children, I think, is a big question. But that would be very, very pivotal. And the last thing is, I do think the uh, gaps, uh, the racial and socioeconomic gaps, um, need to narrow. Uh, we still have these enormous uh, gaps in access, um, uh, in outcomes that have to get done and addressed. Uh, some of them will be best addressed by focused interventions, uh, say on hyper, uh, we talk about hypertension and chronic kidney disease that are predominantly uh, for black Americans. But I think uh, compressing those and in some cases eliminating them are going to be really, really important to get a healthier country. And uh, um, so I think those are the three things that I would really, uh, if I had to de define goals, would be uh, uh, critical goals. Do you think we're going to get there? Yeah, I do. I actually, well, but I'm always an optimist. <laughs> okay. Not here to ask me. <laughs> Amol, how about you? So I share a couple of these with what Zeke said. I think, you know, for me, the number one is this question of health equity and, uh, and starting to see gains against health equity through the innovation agenda of the federal government of the Medicare program. And I think that that has to come in a couple of flavors. I think, one, uh, we need to see every model that's put out in the next decade really have some very directly focused either quality metrics, incentive program, bonus directed at closing gaps, right? Directed at measuring how th those models are producing outcome, access and outcomes for disadvantaged versus other populations, and then directly incentivizing closure of those gaps over time. Uh, part B of that is also specific models targeted kind of like the rural ACO model, right? D directly targeted at specific populations, which perhaps have been very challenging, either because of financial reasons or because of other social reasons to make uh, gains on in terms of quality and or cost. And we need to see a more concerted effort through individualized models. That's kind of number one for me. Number two, I think we have to see participation. What I would love to see, uh, you know, heading off your next question, Rachel, I would say probably hard, but what I would love to see is, every clinician and every beneficiary aligned to some value-based model by 20. 
I think that should be a goal. Whether we get there or not, I think I'm perhaps a little bit more cautious about, but hopefully that should be a, a benchmark to try to hit. The third piece is, uh, is the savings, because that's obviously really important. So I think if you take a catalog of the models to date, what you'll actually find is that the majority of them, greater than 50% of them, actually hit the gross savings mark, but don't hit the net savings mark. What that tells me is that we're more right than wrong in this first decade, right? We're actually getting behavior change. We're getting practice change. We're getting care redesign. So we're, we're sniffing up the right path, folks, right? So we should keep going down that ro road. And what I would say is though, by prioritizing and taking this portfolio approach, we should start to flip the percentages where now instead of most are getting gross savings and some are getting or less than 50% are getting net savings, we should start to see a higher hit rate on net, net savings for each individual set of models we put out. Okay, so I want to give my chance to uh, end here. We're at, at the top of the hour, so my, well, you get the last word. Okay, I will name only one process milestone I will look for, which is that um, the Medicare trust funds survive because Zeke already took the GDP metric. But I will, ah. I will end with the one outcome that matters most to me, and it is, it is not an interim outcome. What I recall is in September of 2019, before the pandemic, we learned in a JAMA report that life expectancy for Americans had plateaued and that mortality was actually increasing for Americans in the prime years of their life. I would like to see that report become obsolete by 2030 and reversed. All right, well, those are some lofty goals. Um, I want to thank you guys for joining me. I've had the privileged position of being able to uh, ask you guys the questions and not have to answer any of them. So uh, thank you for all of that. Um, I enjoyed hearing your answers and I hope the audience did too. And um, keep an eye on our calendar. We have many more good events coming up in the next weeks. So thanks everyone. <laughs>